to do Liz Jump, and I'm John, this is Video Truder, welcome back to Imperator Rome. Yes, I know we've only just wrapped up a series and we're back already. This isn't actually a new series, however. I just wanted to nip back in for a one-off, because Imperator Rome just picked up its first big update, the Pompey update. So I wanted to come and have a little look see at that, because there's some interesting stuff going on. Now, this isn't actually a big expansion pack or DLC or anything. This is a free update for literally everybody, and uh, I think it is very good news indeed, because... Uh, I think it indicates Paradox very much want to take this game in the right direction. They've identified where the problems are, they're moving to fix them. So, let's dive in and talk about what's new. You see, the big thing about the Pompey update for me is, it does feel like they've identified the weak points that need to be improved. And to my mind, one of the big things that needed to be fixed about Imperator Rome was, sometimes it could feel a bit bland or lacking in character. So it didn't really matter whether you were playing, say, you know, some barbarians up in Scotland, or a major well-established Greek power. The game basically felt very, very similar indeed. There wasn't enough diversity of playstyles that came out of what should have been very, very distinct cultures. And there's very much been a move in trying to fix that. And probably the biggest, most obvious way that's been done is for a bit of a refresh of the religious system. So if we just nip down to Greece for a second and rejoin our old friends Alice, oh look at them, they were so tiny back in these days, it's almost odd to think about it now. Yes indeed, Alice, their religion has changed a little bit. Now there's enough to spend religious power on an omen, but the omens are now different from what you may recall. So, for example, they've still got the Blessing of Hermes, but these days that doesn't just boost the amount of commerce income. Instead, it increases national freeman happiness. The actual blessing that used to get unrest down, now that's mercenary army maintenance. And that's where I think this system really starts to shine, which is, it's not just giving different omens to different cultures, it's giving cultures omens that let them specialise in different directions. So, Greece has now got this omen to get the cost of mercenary army maintenance down, and... Uh, Possibly someone else somewhere in the world has this, but I had a quick Luxy roundy. Definitely the vast majority of other religions do not have access to this, meaning as a result of that, religiously Hellenic civilizations have a much easier time running big mercenary armies, which is really, really damn cool. If we jump over to Carthage, however, and the Canaanite religion, those guys do actually have access to national commerce income up, so they can obviously focus on making a giant pile of money through trade, but they also get the favour of Yam, ship damage done up 9%, so they can specialise in having a big, powerful navy, which makes a lot of sense for Carthage and just basically gives a lot more flavour to the campaigns, because it means Carthage can run a much bigger, more powerful navy and much more easily seize control of the seas, which feels very appropriate for them, together with some other good stuff that they get which many people don't, so they can get monthly tyranny down nice and easy, which is very useful for a republic indeed. So yeah, at this point there's a bunch of fun differences between the different religions for different cultures. But it gets a bit more fun yet because you can now also flip religions to change your omens. So yeah, Carthage has the ability to embrace the Hellenic pantheon or the megalithic traditions. All you need to do for that is, yeah, get your main priest character. So for Carthage, that is this guy over here to be actually of that religion. And yeah, obviously, there are downsides to trying to flip the religion of your entire country. It doesn't always go down 100% well with everybody, because then obviously, your country is not the same religion as you. But then you can start using the governor policies to start slowly flipping everybody else to match your religion. And there's one other condition as well. You can't push for a change of religion unless the majority of free people within your capital also already follow that religion. So you could, of course, engineer that by, say, just, you know, using the migrate population button system to basically take people of your old religion away and then bring people from the new religion that you want to embrace in. But this also leads into one other new system. It's a small thing, but it's so, so welcome. Just jumping ship to a Mastodon game for a second here. We now have the ability to move capital. Oh, we can finally do it. Which is very, very important in this game because, of course, capital surpluses are so crucial and the province that your capital's in, basically you have a free surplus of all the goods therein. So being able to move your capital around, very, very good indeed. It's not even that expensive, by the way. So yeah, if I wanted to move the capital of Macedon from up here in Pella down here to Corinth, that would actually only be 610 civic power. So... It's really not that expensive at all if you want to start shuffling your capital around, which is very, very useful indeed. 
Together with the fact that, yeah, if you want to, you can start... Hang on, where's a good example? Yeah, if you want to, you can start actually shuffling around the provincial capital so you can move that into a more favourable location. And that's even bloody cheaper. Only 50 civic power to do that. So, yeah, you've got a lot more flexibility as to where the province capitals are, where your empire itself is based... And this feeds nicely into the religious system, because if you move your capital down to a city where there's lots of people of a different religion, it's a lot easier to do the conversion decision. And just to pick over to Rome for a second, there's a lot of variety here. So even within the Hellenic pantheon, there are multiple different omen groups available. So just because Rome is Hellenic just as Greece is, it doesn't mean you get the same omens. So over here, Rome actually does have access to the Blessing of Mercury, which does increase national commerce income. So they don't get the same omens, as the Greek Hellenic cultures do. So yeah, there's loads of different variety around here. I haven't actually been around like, you know, literally every civilization because in case you hadn't noticed, there's a bloody lot of them. But yeah, there does seem to be a fair amount of variety these days, which is kind of cool. Rome, by the way, is a bit of a good all-rounder, so not bad at all as a starting point. You get a little bit of everything with Rome. And I can't deny the new Blessing of Fortuna, monthly general loyalty up, that is really, really nice right there in an emergency. So I'd say religion's a step in the right direction, but there's also the new heritage system that helps out with the same problem, which is now lots of civilizations basically have a heritage built in, which gives you two benefits and one downside, again, helping to just specialise. So Sparta, for example, gets the special Spartan heritage. So their armies are fundamentally stronger and have better morale than nearby armies. But, because, you know, the helots are forced to wear silly hats that look a bit ridiculous, their slaves are not very happy, so slave output is down. Economically, they're a bit weaker, but in combat, that is a really, really nice benefit to have that you're gonna have throughout the entire game. And again, it's one that very often is set up to try and suit a particular nation's desired playstyle. So, Carthage gets a massive 10% reduction in navy maintenance, and the value of stuff they're exporting in trade is raised, but yeah, they do have problems with loyalty gain chance. So as a result of that, you might rather be using all that extra money you're making from exporting to be buying mercenary armies rather than running your own forces. So it all works very, very nicely indeed. But uh, as we're talking about export value, yeah, we need to talk about the economy and trade because this has gone to some really interesting places. So in the launch version of Imperator Rome, you may recall, trade was basically a ludicrous money printing machine. You wanted to go trade at absolutely 100% of the time because there was absolutely no reason to do anything else. And at first glance, it looks like Paradox have acknowledged this and tried to tone down the trade insanity, which is definitely for the better. So to give you an example, the marketplace building no longer provides any benefit to commerce income whatsoever. It just boosts local tax instead. Now that's good for easing down the amount of money made off commerce, but I'll admit, it's an odd way to do it given the marketplace was already garbage and now it's been made even worse, but whatever. More crucially, certain trade goods have now been changed over. So a bunch of trade goods that used to increase local provincial commerce income have now been changed to do other things. So, for example, Spice used to actually boost commerce income by, I think it was like 15% just by having it present inside a given province. Nope, now that boosts local citizen output instead. Glass used to do the same, but that now boosts civilization level 2. Silk, however, does still boost commerce value, but now it's pretty much alone in doing that. It's much harder to just ship over a bunch of goods to a province and make ludicrous commerce money. And yet in other ways... In other ways, they've actually doubled down and made trade even more bananas. You see, nipping over to my old friends over here in Knossos, they actually now begin the game with two import trade routes available to them. One of those is available because the new tax for commerce, yeah, the default starting position, is capital import routes plus one. Absolutely fine and dandy. The other one is available because of ports in province. Every port is now worth an import trade route. Now, this can potentially get out of hand very quickly, because if we say look at the whole of Crete here, if I were to take over the whole of Crete, that would be, hang on, how many ports are here? I think it's four, because yeah, we've got this over here, that's a port, then we've got ourselves, that's a port right there, there's a port right there as well. Yeah, and that's a port down over here. So basically, 
If you take the entirety of Crete, you have plus four import trade routes for free for the entire game, which is an awful lot before you get into any form of tech or benefit whatsoever. The best one I found in the game, by the way, I think is down over here in the southern tip of Italy, the province of Calabria. That's got access to five ports. Now, if there's anything higher than that, I haven't seen it. I did have a look around the Aegean and all sorts of other likely spots, and I never saw anything with a greater number than four ports in a single province. So... I think the southern tip of Italy is basically, yeah, trade capital of the world, if that's what you want to do. Also, while I'm thinking of it, yeah, the new move capital system does actually interact with the trade system really nicely, because in order to trade for something, you've got to be in range of it. So if you're not in range of anything good, then you can literally just move your capital, and then maybe you'll move into range of something good. So, yeah, that's worth having a think about, actually. Moving your entire capital just to move your diplomatic range, just to trade for alternative goods, that could very much be worth thinking about. Now, you're probably thinking, John, this doesn't sound like such a big change. This is just a nice bonus for island-based empires. It's good. Island-based empires should have a natural tendency towards trade. Absolutely, but we haven't reached the point where this goes into lunatic territory yet. And that is these buttons over here, the new investment buttons. Now, some of these are perfectly reasonable. Like, say, over here, make religious endowments. So, spend 300 religious power, and as a result of that, after two years of productivity being a bit reduced, then everyone who follows the state religion locally will get plus 3% happiness. Okay, that's a nice to have, nothing too special there. Or we could spend 300 military power in order to get population output up 2% for the rest of the game, together with local provincial loyalty up. Again, nice to have, not exactly game-changing. Or we could actually have an additional building slot. Honestly, not great buildings, they're not spectacular. But then, but then we get to the oratory investment. Spend 300 oratory, and after two years, you have local import routes up plus one inside that province. And that's repeatable. And as far as I can tell, there's no upper cap on it. You can just do that over and over and over again. So you may recall in my Ellis playthrough, I think by the end of that playthrough, I had like, what was it? 15, 16 trade routes coming into my capital. So I'm going to show you something right now that blows that a bit out of the water. So this here is a game I set up where I've got a very early game master on. I've barely expanded at all. I've taken a little bit of land over here. Rome's taken Etruria and eaten a bit of southern Italy. But you can see here, there's barely been any consolidation in Europe. This is very, very early on in the game. However, if I just go over to my capital, I've got 18 import routes coming into Pella right now. So sure, a couple of those are coming off tech, logistics, bureau and river barges, two techs that show up early on, and I get plus one for being a regional power, and plus two because there's two ports in the local area, but 11 of those 18 are me just investing with this oratory investment. It is absolutely flipping ridiculous, and I kind of love it. You might look at that and think, that's ridiculous, how can that possibly be a thing? I kind of love it because it fits into the new population system really nicely. You see, these days, every city has a population hard cap. Well, it's not really a hard cap. It's a soft cap, but it's kind of a hard cap. Look, populations won't grow beyond the hard cap, but if you shove people in through slavery, they are happy to hang out there. But yeah, there will be overpopulation problems, and I think at that point, it will basically just slowly trend down towards the population capacity. So you need to keep your population cap moving upwards if you want to keep more and more people living inside your capital. And the only way to do that is to keep bringing more and more stuff into the empire. Because a bunch of goods that used to just increase rate of population growth, like grain for example, now instead boost the total population capacity of a given city. And that's also what granaries do too. They add on to the base population capacity of the city. So... If you want to form a mega city, these days, you've got to have granaries times load, you've got to be in the right environment, climate's actually a factor, number of trade routes available is a factor, grain, granaries, civilization value, whether or not it's on farmland. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff that adds onto your population cap. So if you want to grow mega cities, eventually you're just going to have to be needing more and more and more trade routes to just import more and more and more grain, which I really like because this is kind of how the ancient world worked. Rome could never have reached maybe around a million citizens because we think Rome at its height could have had about a million people living in it. 
And that would have been impossible without huge grain imports coming in, like tons and tons of grain arriving constantly from Egypt. Without that, Rome could never have existed in the form it actually did. So this new system basically means you have to be spending, as the game goes on, more and more of your oratory, just investing more and more into trade routes to bring in more and more grain to stop the population collapsing, and it's absolutely beautiful. Though if you don't actually fancy just trying to build a mega city, yeah, there are two new policies, centralise and decentralise the population, where basically going forward, either people will move from your province to the capital or from your capital out to the other provincial cities. So yeah, if it becomes too much of a problem, you can redistribute people like that. But yeah, the idea of trying to build a mega city, that's kind of fun. That's definitely fun. It's more viable now than it used to be now that you can have infinite trade routes stacked on top of each other. And it also solves the problem with the various currencies at the top here, which is sometimes as the game went on, I just found myself constantly floating giant piles of currency that I had absolutely nothing to do with. Civic's never been a problem because Civic unlocks technology, so there's always technology you're going to want. Civic's always in demand. And military power doesn't matter if you're floating fairly large amounts of that because, yeah, the traditions are really, really, really bloody expensive, so that's fine. But sometimes I'd find myself in the mid to late game floating a fair bit of oratory. Early game, that's not a problem because you'll be using it to fabricate claims. But yeah, mid to late game... I was sometimes floating a lot of oratory, so I just threw it away with the cultural assimilation business. But these days, when you can use it to just create bonus trade routes, yeah, that is something really, really powerful right there. And that actually very conveniently brings us over to Zeal, because Zeal was always the unloved cousin of the currencies. I always thought that was the trash one I never paid any attention to. Yeah, Zeal just got a very major upgrade, which is tied to the new stability system. You see, stability used to be between minus three and plus three, starting at zero at the beginning of a new game. And now it's on a scale of between zero and a hundred, starting at 50. So all seems like the same so far, except these days, it wants to trend back towards 50. Which, while it sounds a bit dry, is actually a very massive important change. You see, in the old world of Imperator, you'd stab a pig and go up from zero to plus one. And that would be permanent until something changed it. Not anymore. Now instead, stabbing a pig gives you a gain stability of 0.2 for the next five years. So now we can see stability starting to go up, but it's already starting to slow down. You're no longer gaining 0.2, you're gaining 0.18 because it's trying to trend back down to 50. So the effect of stabbing the pig is already less than what it was. So roll forward a few years and stability's not even up to 55 yet, so some modest increases. Population growth up a tiny, tiny amount, legitimacy up a tiny bit if you're a monarchy, research points up, yeah, barely 2%, comma sync in the same again, and as soon as we hit, yeah, 455, and as a result of that the pig wears off, it'll start trending straight back down to 50. So... Back in the old days, you'd just basically stab pigs as soon as you could, get yourself up to plus three, and live there for the rest of the game, because why wouldn't you want those lovely juicy benefits? These days, if you want high stability, you need to be engaging in major investment in pig stabbing. Like, you need to be stabbing pigs all the flipping time, constantly stabbing pigs, meaning that leaders who are providing high zeal to the empire are now very, very useful indeed. And it's even harder than you think to actually maintain stability because these days a whole bunch of stuff makes it go down. So holding any triumph for anybody whatsoever leads to minus five to stability. And on top of that, any law change whatsoever is a base cost of 25 stability down. I think tribes used to get something like that by default, but now it affects literally everybody. So yeah, these days keeping your stability up is actually very difficult. Not only is it very hard to keep it high, Actually, keeping it from being too low is a problem, especially as low stability, which is now going to be a lot more common, directly feeds in to the new civil war and rebellion system, which is now a lot better. Because revolt and civil wars are now tied to the new power base system, which is a lot better, because it represents that people are not equal and that people have power in different ways. So basically, yeah, in Mastodon at the moment, what we've actually got ourselves here is a power base of 100, 25 of which exists in the hands of somebody who is not loyal. And the not loyal person's power base is made up of various constituent parts. So a tiny bit of its wealth, but he's not like super wealthy, so that's not a big deal. What's more important is, yes, he's got a giant pile of loyal cohorts under his command. So as a result of that, not only is his loyalty ticking down from those, but he's got a good power base built up from them. 
Now I'm fine for the time being because my ruler is actually the commander of the main army. So as a result of that, yeah, he's got a massive amount of power off his commanding cohorts too. He's got a bit more wealth. He's the ruler so he gets a default plus five as a base. And the capital region is of a good size so that's providing a good benefit too. But here's where things get really fun, which is the threshold at which a civil war might start is now completely elastic and shuffles based on the new stability system. So right now, yeah, the threshold is 27.55%, which is being negatively impacted by negative stability. So right now, there's not a threat of a civil war, purely because, yeah, this guy is in fact on 25%. Though, I will say, paradox, if anyone from you guys is listening, this could do with a bit of work because the problem is the threshold is given to you as a percentage, but the actual power base of the disloyal characters is given as an absolute number. Now that's fine because on this occasion, yeah, by lucky coincidence, the total power base is 100, but it's not always 100. That's just a happy accident. Sometimes, yeah, it can be not 100. So figuring out how close you are to the threshold can be a little bit on the tricky side. It would ideally be useful if, yeah, we were told what the actual percentage was, not just the absolute number of the disloyal characters. But here, of course, is where everything starts coming together in fun ways, which is, if I were to want to, say, change a law right now, well, changing a law causes a stability drop. So, uh, say I want to actually have ourselves, yeah, professional oarsmen. That seems like a good idea. Rather than slaves rowing the boat, let's actually have some proper professional oarsmen. Oh no, stability just dropped massively. What have I just accidentally done? Oh, I've triggered a civil war. Gotcha. Because now the threshold for a civil war has dropped to 22.55. And as a result of that, this 25% is now high enough to start triggering a civil war. So on this occasion, this guy is pretty easy to deal with. Because yeah, his strength is coming from the fact that he's got loyal cohorts. So let's just actually reward some of those veterans. And uh, yeah, let's also encourage some deserters. Uh, and we'll see what happens next month as a result of that. Is the Civil War still on, by the way? The Civil War's still on, unfortunately, right? Actually, give it a minute. I think we might have just actually avoided it. 22.6 and... Oh, hang on. Have we just about managed to avoid... Yes, we've just about managed to avoid it. So his power base has fallen underneath the threshold because, yeah, with stability so low, it's trying to trend back towards 50. So as a result of that, it's actually fairly aggressively growing because it's so low. So yeah, if you get it too high, it'll aggressively go down. Get it too low, it'll aggressively go up. It's a very interesting mechanic, especially the way it now interacts with a whole bunch of different systems, like changing laws. Ah, yes, and speaking of loyalty, yeah, people aren't just as effective as they can be these days. These days, how effective someone is at a job is a function both of the relevant stats and how loyal they are. If they're not loyal, they'll do a bit of a half-assed job. So this guy with a zeal of 6, only loyalty of 50%, however, means, yeah, we're not getting much benefit out of him. But if we were having problems with people in government, it's a lot more complicated than it used to be because even as a monarch, you can't just throw them in prison and execute them anymore. There's a brand new system. So say I wanted to get rid of this guy. These days, uh, can't imprison him. Instead, uh, he needs to actually be brought to trial. So let's actually try and do that. He's a little bit corrupt, which is good, and his power base is appalling. So as a result of that, we have got at least a reasonable chance of actually getting rid of him. So uh, there's now a proper little event chain attached to trying to dispose of government members, which is very, very cool indeed. So depending on your personality and what he's done in his life, yeah, different options will show up. On this occasion, I can either say, screw it, I'm not going to try you after all. Say, oh dear, you have abused your office in a slightly unspecific way and gain some free popularity as well. Plus that increases my chance of success by a small amount. Lovely. Alternatively, I can just say, screw it, I'm the king, I get to try you for whatever I bloody well feel like it. I'm going to try you for eating the last biscuit in the tin, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. So that would get me some tyranny, but it would increase my chance of success by a large amount, because when I'm making up whatever accusation I want, well, presumably it's a lot easier to convict someone of an accusation I've just made up. So yes, I'm just going to say, screw you. And on this occasion, we've been lucky. He decided to actually make a break for it, because he got panicked by all of the character assassination, and he ran directly into the king, both ending up sprawled on the ground. He actually loses a bit of health for that. Marvellous. And because he ran, yeah, the chance of succeeding is now going up. I've got a high chance of success. 68% and rising. 
And now we move on to a technicality. As the hours draw on, members of the court begin to grow weary with constant questioning, vitriol and drama. He finally takes to the floor, waxing lyrical on the subject of his eternal loyalty to Mastodon. As he speaks, a curious smile creases his face. It seems that while drawing up details of the accusation, our examiners had neglected to check his whereabouts on the eve of his supposed criminal activity. He was in fact visiting Apulia on a diplomatic mission. Right, so, uh, we can either back down on this occasion, where, yeah, that actually decreases the chance of our success because he's now got an alibi, or we can say, screw you, Apu Lee is lying, like the entire cocky country, which gets me a little bit of aggressive expansion. Apu Lee hates me because I just called them liars in the court of law, but it does make it more likely that he actually will be convicted. So, screw you, Apu Lee are all totally liars. And as a result of that, he has been found guilty of all charges. Hooray! So now he has been arrested. So you can't just imprison people anymore. There's a little court thing, which is a lot more interesting. It adds a lot more flavour. This is the sort of thing Imperator needs. So I'm very glad to see the trial now exists. Ah, yes, and one more very cool thing indeed, while we're actually over here with Macedon. Yeah, marriage actually now has a purpose. It used to be kind of about alliances between you and different families, but honestly, it didn't really do much in the original version. Now, your consort acts a bit more like a wife or husband did in Crusader Kings 2, which is they get to contribute their highest stat to the nation if it's better than yours, which can be very useful indeed for covering up for weaknesses in your ruler. Particularly useful, of course, in monarchies. So, for example, my current terrible king is decent in charisma, but terrible at everything else. So, if we could find a nice wife who was, yeah, good at civic, and also ideally good at religion too, to provide coverage for both of them, that'd be lovely. And here we go. Six is okay. Nine's not bad. Five is better than three. Congratulations, I'm marrying you. Hooray! Couple of other fun things, by the way, in Monarchy specifically. Government interactions. So these are basically little choices you can make. Some of them are just nice to have. Like, yeah, Hold Games has moved from a decision on the character sheet down over here. But basically, it's the same as it ever was. Boost your popularity a little bit. Though these days, it's ticking over time rather than a big amount up front. Just by spending some of your own money and some of Mastodon's money as well. Patronise the arts in order to get, yeah, primary culture happiness and civilization change up. Which is very, very nice indeed. This one's lovely, by the way. Summoning the War Council. I think tribes had this already, if I recall correctly. But yeah, now all monarchies have it by default. So yeah, basically you just get yourself a free Kalsus Belli against one of three targets. Though you can turn down all of them if they don't come up with the right answer. So there we go. On that occasion, I just get myself a free Kalsus Belli against Azania. So I could go and take over those guys. No hit stability whatsoever. Absolutely flipping lovely. And that's very useful because... In this new world of stacking endless trade routes on top of each other, yeah, it's definitely a good idea to be having as much oratory as you can to be doing that. So using as little oratory as possible on claims, good thing. That's a really nice advantage for monarchies these days. Republics work the same way, by the way. These days, yeah, when there's an election, the person in first and second place both get to become consul, or rather consul and co-consul, where once again, whoever has the highest stat gets to actually contribute it to the nation. It's just, yeah, unfortunately on this occasion, this guy's terrible. And if you need to know national popularity for calculating anything else, it's an average of the two of them, whereas corruption is the corruption of the consul and the co-consul put together. Though for the sake of factions figuring out who's currently in power, it's only the consul who's officially in power. The co-consul just doesn't get to count. So yeah, right now, the civic faction's in power, the military faction is not. And once again, the faction in power does provide a benefit, though these have changed a bit because some of them have moved over to the government interactions. So when the civic faction's in power, you'll always get national tax up 20%. But you can also pay 75 civic to actually get build costs down 15% and populist faction influence up 0.25. So never do that because buildings are still kind of trash. I mean, not as bad as they used to be because I suppose granaries are a lot more useful than they used to be. But yeah, that's a lot of influence for the populist faction for not much benefit. Meanwhile, yeah, 150 military power will get you discipline up and populist faction influence up 0.25 again. So that's 150 because the military faction isn't in power. If they were in power, that would be 75 and the first one we looked at would have been 150. Merchants get commerce income up by default and yeah, you can pay to actually get the create trade costs route down, which is honestly not great to be honest because yeah, it's hardly that expensive and it does come down a lot through text anyway. Religion gets, yeah, omen power up 10% by default, which is nice. 
convert pop cost 25% by paying under the right circumstances, not bad. Especially as, bear in mind, these days, you can actually choose to flip your religion. So, if you did want to flip your religion at some point, could be worth thinking about. The populist, meanwhile, yeah, still get power costs up 10%, which is bad. But they can actually now force monthly corruption down, which is kind of useful. And there's a bunch of just little things all over the shop, by the way. This isn't going to be exhaustive, because there's so much stuff here. Like, yeah, this very convenient button... View characters. You can now see all the characters in any other faction, which is very useful because, yeah, it was very difficult when you were trying to sabotage another faction when you couldn't actually see who the disloyal characters were and thus weren't really able to directly interact with them. These days, you can just look into another faction, figure out who's disloyal and therefore decide to try and do things with them. Like, yeah, inspiring further disloyalty. Very, very useful indeed. Oh, here's a fun one. I haven't actually unlocked it as this is Rome right at the beginning of the game, but yeah, you can now actually build roads to a given destination. So if I just select build military road and then just like click up here, for example, they'll just keep building roads till they get there, which is a nice time saver. And now people can embark directly onto boats, even if they're in harbours, which to my mind should have been the case all along because that just makes bloody sense. But yes, that's a lot easier than it used to be. There we go. Much flipping easier. So yeah, there's a bunch of little stuff like that, but while we're actually looking at boats right here, yeah, navies. Navies have had a really, really big damn overhaul. So you may notice there are various different types of ship here. Basically, starting off on the lightest over here, going up towards medium and then into heavy. The short version is the bigger ships do tons of damage and are increasingly effective at smashing little ships, but... The little ships do morale damage and thus have a chance of actually capturing big ships if they're capable of driving them off. So an absolutely ridiculous mega swarm of tiny ships might be able to totally surround a smaller fleet of elite vessels and actually capture some of them and bring them into the navy. So yeah, actually going out of your way to try and capture ships can be a very, very good thing indeed. But they're not very good at actually doing damage to bigger ships. So potentially a small force of elite ships can absolutely trash a large force of smaller ones. But if you could just get enough smaller ones, maybe, just maybe, you can actually catch some big stuff. Probably better to go for a mixed group, however, because these days basically naval combat works like land combat. It's a lot more complicated. So you do actually have, yeah, a front line, a second line and a flanking cohort as well. So probably putting the little ships on the flank to actually just kind of move in and try and capture as the battle goes on. That's the right idea. While putting your big ships up front is good too. But we come back to things being distinctive at this point because... This is a really, really cool new feather that's just been added to the Hellenic Nation's caps. You see, the military traditions have just been updated with two new ones for Greece. Now Greece gets really early on if they want to take it, proud shipwrights and mines bigger than yours, allowing them to recruit the Octera and the Mega Polyreme. Now, I don't think anyone else actually gets these. These are exclusively for Greece and they're really, really damn amazing. They're also really, really damn expensive, by the way. Yeah, they take like most of a year to create. In fact, it's a full year by default. But these days, a surplus of wood gets you 50% build speed up on ships. Which, one, makes a lot of sense. And two, is actually really welcome. Because these days, naval combat happens a lot more than it used to. For reasons we'll cover in a second. But yeah, these things are expensive to build, damn it. Really expensive to build and very expensive to maintain as well. If you're wondering what a mega polyreme is, by the way, they're pretty much as badass as they sound because, yeah, during this period of history, there was basically a genuine arms race to see who could build the biggest ships. This would continue, I believe, until roughly the end of the Second Roman Civil War when Octavian beat Mark Antony because Mark Antony fielded ridiculous, ludicrous mega ships to try and stop Octavian, but was actually defeated. And that was kind of the end of the mega ship as an idea. Basically, at that point, everyone concluded, oh, megaships are actually really expensive and not even that effective. Maybe we should stop trying to build giant floating fortresses. And that was the tragic end of the mega polyreme. So that's all lovely and whatever, and now I've got mega ships, so that gives me a real edge in naval combat. And yeah, you do now indeed get tactics, which work exactly like land tactics, where some work better against others and work better depending on what the composition of your navy actually is. So yeah, on this occasion, probing attacks just fine. But there's a lot more to it than just smashing enemy navies. Navies can now play an active role in land warfare, which is what makes the new heavy ships so damn amazing. So I've just dropped off a giant pile of troops down over here. 
And they've got a fortress to siege through. And dear, oh dear, fortresses, eh? Aren't they a pain? I wonder if there's something my navy could do to help. Oh my goodness, it turns out there is. So if I'm willing to pay 30 military strength and actually sacrifice a bit of hull strength for one of my big heavy ships, and these guys are, yeah, big and expensive, I can actually create a breach in the walls. And a breach is a permanent dice modifier going forward. So I can make the siege a lot easier for me. But there's something even better I can do, which is... I can assault the port. So in the event there is a city with a fortress that also has a port present, my fleet can just attack the port by itself, reducing the level of the fortress. Currently, it's one. So I could just reduce that to zero right now. And there we go. That place just doesn't have a fortress anymore. A fortress has just been deleted off the flipping map. And all I had to pay for that was one of my mega polyremes being down from 100% health to 30% health. So I can just send it home and heal it up. That's it. That is literally all I needed to do. So basically for campaigns against cities with ports, the mega polyremes are now absolutely devastating. Because they can literally just sacrifice a modest amount of health to knock down fortresses. It's ludicrous and I love it. And it means navies aren't just a way of getting troops from point A to point B anymore. They genuinely contribute a huge amount to the ground war. Now, unfortunately, the Gortinian capital right here doesn't have a port. So my mega polyreme can't just go in and knock down the fortress by itself, as lovely as that would be. But there's more I might be able to do yet if I just move my fleet round the corner. So while my army's actually just getting on with sieging down that place, I'm just going to, yeah, send some troops over in this direction. See if maybe, just maybe, there might be some good opportunities around over here. Ah, sadly this territory doesn't have a port, it's just got a fortress. There's nothing I can do there. But I do have more options. This one's hilarious, by the way. Navies can just take territories without needing to bother getting the army involved at all. If there is an unfortified enemy port, you can just take it for 30 military, as long as you've got 5 or more heavy ships at 50% health or above. So basically if I was at war with, say, yeah, these guys over here, this territory has no fortress and has a port, I could just go and take Epidal Ross Limera, and there's nothing anyone could do to flipping stop me. I can just go in and spend a bit of military power to have it because heavy ships are now brilliant and navies are genuinely useful. And finally, we can also just go around doing port raids if you want to. Though, yeah, you do need to actually get up to the right military tradition to do that. So at that point, go up to any port that you feel like. And even if there actually is a fortress level there, you can actually just carry off some slaves, which is beautiful. Here we go. So I could actually attack these guys right here with the slave raid. And uh, that would actually get me one aggressive expansion per slave. But yeah, I just pick up some Cretan freemen, move them over to my capital, turn them into slaves. Everything is just hunky-dory. And that's a really good way of boosting your economy. Ah, yes. One other important change to navies too. Just as navies now act very much like armies do in terms of the way they fight and the way they can contribute to land campaigns, uh, pirates have had a major overhaul as well, which is... They act like slightly weird mercenaries in a way. So here we go. In the mercenaries tab, you've got the usual armies, but you've got the navies as well. Obviously, navies have always been a lot cheaper than armies, so even mercenary pirates are not so bad. But yeah, you can now actually hire them to work for you. And what's interesting is, yeah, the pirate navies can often have really heavy ships in them. So yeah, for example, right down over here, we got ourselves a fairly major pirate navy, including a bunch of heavy ships. So if you can't build heavy ships yourself, I think the only way you're allowed to actually have them, and thus do all the special actions, like seizing ports, if you're not of a Hellenic culture, is to hire Hellenic pirates to do it for you, which is kind of cool. But here's something I find even cooler. You can have your own pet pirates as well. So if we go over to the laws here, yeah, the maritime laws. If you want to, you can actually have the non-interference law here. So as a result of that, yeah, commerce income up 20%. Great. Pirate fleet maintenance down 10%. Even flipping better. And on top of that, you get yourself a pirate haven in one of your port cities. But you don't get to choose which one. So yeah, 100%. I'm going to be doing that, thank you. Ah, here we go. On this occasion, it's actually spawned down here, the bit of Crete I just took over. So yeah, there is now a pirate haven down on Crete that basically I am aware of and just sort of tacitly overlook. 
So as a result of that, local tax is actually up 20%, population grows a bit faster, and that place is actually growing its own pirate navy. And it's not a bad one, you know, actually. That's a decent pirate force right there. So they're just going to sit there waiting to be hired. But the thing about pirates compared to mercenaries is they're a bit more fighty, shall we say. Which is, in the event that they actually don't get hired by either you or anyone else for a while, then they get bored and just go off and raid. But I think if it's your pirates in your base, they won't raid you. They'll go and raid someone else, which is fine, doesn't affect me in the slightest. But it does lead to other people having a Kausas Bella against me. I'm pretty sure, yeah, hosting pirates in your territory mean other people have the right to declare war against you to go and destroy your pirate cove. And if that territory ever gets taken, then the occupiers will have the choice to just burn the cove to the ground. Which we don't want because we like these pirates. They're very, very useful. You may also be looking at that fleet, by the way, and thinking, wow, that's actually a pretty damn good admiral right there. Bloody hell, Marshal of Thirteen. Yeah, something else just happened to both pirates and mercenaries, by the way, which is they've got a lot better, which they really needed to because, yeah, it was so weird seeing mercenaries being absolutely terrible. Mercenary armies now get themselves a nice little bonus, which is just by virtue of being a mercenary captain, they get themselves a plus five to marshal by default. Meaning, yeah, if you just happen to get lucky, having people with a marshal of nine and then another five on top for being a mercenary captain is not that unusual. So mercenaries can basically reach the level of skill that you don't often see elsewhere. 14 to 16 strength generals leading mercenary bands, not unusual. So mercenaries are even better than they used to be, but the price has been put up to offset that. Luckily, as we've said before, there's now a lot more you can do to specialise, so you can get the price of mercenaries down, through religion for example. Ooh, small thing by the way, though it can make a big difference in certain parts of the world, yeah, there's now rivers that boats can actually sail along, so uh, yeah, this fleet can go up to this port here, because this river's wide enough to sail up, at least as far as to the point where it gets a bit narrow, north of Pella right there. And yeah, you can actually fight naval battles in rivers, but if you do, the tiny ships do have an advantage there, which is very very, very cool indeed. Now that doesn't make a huge difference there, but if we look over to, yes, Egypt, it does have a big impact because yeah, this is a small river that anyone can just walk over. The big rivers you can only cross at the actual designated fording point. So invading Egypt is now a lot harder than it used to be because there's a whole bunch of natural barriers where yeah, if they decide to fortify the far side, as a result of that, it's a lot harder to push across the rivers. But of course, the big impact here is of course, the Rhine itself, which is now basically, yeah, a massive great barrier across much of Northern Europe. Now, at the beginning of the game, that doesn't really matter much because all of this is unclaimed territory. But as the game goes on, and yeah, expansion happens into this territory through colonisation and military colonisation, eventually this river will form a very useful natural barrier where you could potentially hold behind it and fortify the territories the other side of the crossing. And just like a sea in a fort elsewhere, if you bring your ships up to here, then no one's allowed to use the fort until they're able to dislodge your ships. So yeah, you can actually clog up the crossing points and be really, really damn secure behind major rivers. Particularly useful for territories in this part of the world, useful for Egypt too. Are there any other major rivers, by the way? Zoom right out here. Honestly, I would actually like it if, yes, yeah, some rivers were just upgraded to be bigger rivers. There's another big one over here, by the way. Yeah, it would be nice if some rivers were upgraded to be big rivers. Just because it's very tactically interesting to have limited crossing points where you can fortify. It's very, very cool indeed, so I hope they expand that even further, but it is a nice little thing to have. And there is probably a whole bunch of other little bits and pieces. There's been a lot of tiny changes, but I think those are the big ones, and I think you get the point. The reason I wanted to talk about this today is because uh, I think Imperator Rome is going in the right direction. These are all positive changes that make things distinctive and full of character and flavour. And the things that Imperator Rome arguably was missing when it first launched. The trials in particular, I do like. The fact that navies actually have a function, I do like. I love the different cultures and religions now specialise in different directions. That's really cool. Loving the new navies, especially the big Greek boats that can actually contribute to the land war. So having naval superiority now is actually a big deal. Previously, it was just a nice to have. It was purely about transport. But now, now it's actually very useful for seizing territory along the coast. So uh, there's a lot here I like. This is moving in a good direction, ladies and gentlemen. As I say, we're not starting a new series yet. I'm waiting for a big expansion for that. 
ideally one that looks at politics and subterfuge. I would expect that's what they're going to look at first. Because making the characters more, well, characterful, that is where they need to improve things right now. But we're moving in the right direction. I was already very fond of Imperator Rome. It's getting places now. It's really getting places. So... Uh, one to watch, ladies and gentlemen. One day, this will be back with a brand new series. And uh, I'm looking forward to it already because I want to build the biggest navy that ever navied. It's going to be flipping beautiful. But in the meantime, I've been John Smith, many a true nerd. And this has just been a quick look at the Pompey update of Imperator Rome. Thank you very much and goodbye. No, this no, this no, guy's no. enjoying that. This guy's enjoying his elephant a bit too much. In Fair Verona, we set our scene. Oh my god, Becky, look at her butt. It is so big. They've managed to glitch inside one of the buildings. Elephants in the rear! And then oh, in come the chariots! Yeah.